asking a sort of survey who's in the room. Apart from the hackware folks, uh, you're all undergrads, is that a safe bet? Uh, in what fields? What are you studying? Electrical engineering. Electrical engineering. Anything else? Electrical. Hmm? Yeah. Um, electrical. electrical engineering. Yeah. Comsci. Yeah. Mechanical engineering. Any other fields? Yeah. Okay, you're not place. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and anyone who's not doing engineering of any sort? Okay, great, excellent. That means most of this makes some sense. <laughs> um, so, yeah, per the description, this is a. Uh, I oh, will sit down a minute. <laughs> Talk and demonstration by example that the, uh, the ground station operation for at least some kinds of satellite isn't all that difficult. Uh, there's only a matter of fiddly mechanical and electronic software stuff involved, but it's not necessarily the case that you have to tie yourself to uh, either a commercial facility or go through the process of getting a, a university to authorize setting up a ground station. So there's a, on top of the health building, I believe, there's a UHF ground station for a the CQT guys who have a couple of satellites uh, in orbit. So that they went through that process and getting up on that roof is hard. I mean it's physically hard, let alone the, the engineering work and all the other work has to do to make that possible. So the point here is you don't actually need to do that. But with much less gear you can in fact operate. So uh, that's near Book Timber Road, just outside my apartment in fact. So I can't I've got space where I live, there's a field next to it, and the Singapore Land Authority, it was a difficult discussion at first, but fairly quickly we were like, oh yeah, okay, that's fine. You can use this anytime, no problem. So it's, uh, I won't go much into that, but because of uh, sort of land availability problems in Singapore, this is a permanent problem, that putting up antennas of different sorts, there's always someone who has to, a need to have a discussion, there's someone who's going to go, oh my god, that's you know, going to get me in trouble. Uh, so part of what I'm doing is also gently pushing and helping various bureaucracies to make it normal to uh, set up antennas and operate in public. Uh, the slides are there. The, uh, that will appear at the end of the talk if you wish. So feel free to photograph if you like, but the slides will be online. So, uh, so in sort of context, this is amateur radio. Um, I know some people in the room have heard of it. How many in the room have, how many others have heard of amateur radio or have some idea what it is? It's blank, okay, fine. Um, so this is a, uh, I guess, a, practice, a set of practices and a licensing arrangement that has been operating for almost a century. Uh, in fact, what sparked it was a miscommunication after the sinking of the Titanic. There was a mishandling of a message, a bunch of newspapers reported that no lives were lost, and then it turned out that that wasn't true. And so suddenly the press wanted to blame someone, and so the, the amateurs were an appropriate target. At that point, licensing came into play. The, the amateurs have to be licensed have to identify themselves um, and can only operate in frequencies that are designated for that kind of use. Uh, but essentially, it's, if you like tinkering with stuff and you want to do so with more than, with radio, more than what you can do with ISM band radio gear. So if you've got like Wi-Fi or Bluetooth or that sort of stuff, you're limited to the tens or hundreds of milliwatts. Um, yeah, you certainly can't do much on UHF or UHF. Um, broad divisions, so, uh, interference by lights and motors doesn't is a whole lot of problem, but eventual transmitters generally break into low power devices, ISM band gear, um, which are licensed free. Sorry, Mr. Step. License free. So, things you can do to transmit radio signals without a license are garage door openers, Wi Fi, Bluetooth, that sort of stuff, but you, your power is limited and therefore your range is limited. Uh, if you're licensed, this is not complete, but roughly broadcasters, telcos, uh, private mobile systems for, for, for land, sea, and air, and amateurs. And what differs for amateurs is that you're required to pass what amounts to an engineering exam. And consequently, you have an amount of freedom to DIY, to build your own equipment. Uh, no one in Singapore has yet built their own radios, so I'm about to. We'll do so for make a fair next month. I'm now running late. But, uh, so that's part of the issue. It's not just that it's a licensed service, it's also a licensed service that allows you to build and operate radios without, at least in theory, uh, third party engineering involved in inspecting before you go on air. Whereas these other, the, the marital, mar marine and mobile, mobile, land mobile tend to be controlled by manufacturing controls, and the broadcasters and telcos tend to require engineering review before the stations can go online. 
and so that's evidence we don't do that with our own review. Um, this is sort of why bother. I mean, sort of telephone in the 19th century, broadcast radio started for real in the early 20th, uh, amateur radio in 1915, shortly after the Titanic. Uh, internet in 69, cellular mobile in 79, mobile internet mid 90s, and for the last decade, ubiquitous mobile. And ubiquitous, it turns out, in different things at the times, we're looking at now 5G, which is even faster, and satellite clusters, with hundreds of satellites that would then do blanket coverage for certainly the, uh, the low latitudes, possibly the entire planet. So this sort of beg the question why would you do this? Um, and so the, the purpose, this is the IDA's handbook, or the IDA's, and I made this slide, uh, but similar language is used in almost every jurisdiction. Uh, it's a little bit like the rationale for maker activity, except that it relates specifically to communication systems. So it's stuff you're doing for your own interest, your own education, and not to make money at it. So it, these other things assume that you're making money. In practice, that means an incredible range of things. Uh, public service, not so relevant here because Singapore is very dense and content work is complete. But in places like the US and Australia, the spaces involved are too large. So it simply cannot cover the entire space. So if you're holding like a, a cycle event or a running event over some enormous distance in the US in like desert conditions in US or Australia, you're far outside mobile network coverage. So if you want communications for the event organizer, they've either got to go and do their own uh, land mobile that set up or partner with amateur club and, and arrange comms that way. So that's one of the issues. Another variant of that is what happened in Puerto Rico a few years ago. The, uh, the hurricane, which I forget, was sufficiently violent that the uh, cell towers were physically gone. It, 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 mobile phones are useless if there's nothing for to talk to. And of course, they lost comms and power and roads simultaneously. And that, that's a real problem. The Red Cross goes in and they can't communicate. They can get in, it's difficult, but they, they can't talk. So the Red, the Red Cross asked the American Radio Relay League to call for and did 50 volunteers to go and do two week tours at various of the hospitals that the Red Cross was running in Puerto Rico to allow there to be some minimal comms while they waited for the roads to get fixed. So that then the power companies would come in and fix the power networks and then the telcos would come in and fix the, the phone towers. So that's, that's a, a not, sort of a special case of public service. It's only once that it's there's been a formal involvement in a disaster at that scale, but it's something that Amazon are capable of. Uh, distance, long distance operations is an interesting one. It's one that Amazon has invented. It's the use of the ionosphere as a either reflector or a refractor. A bit like lenses in, in glasses. You can the, the, the different gradient of uh, ions, particularly electrons, charged particles, particularly electrons in the ionosphere, provide enough gradient difference to allow signals at a particular frequency range to be reflected or reflected. And so amateurs use this to communicate. Uh, maritime users used to do it, not so much at the moment. Uh, when you're in city areas, that's not very convenient. You sort of handhold radios, talk talk about things. So amateurs sort to of put up repeaters on the tops of tall buildings. Or the extreme form of that is buildings that are very, very high and very fast moving, satellites. That's been going on since the beginning of the space race. There were amateurs working for uh, one of the contractors who was doing the Corona program, which is about 100 launches for the CIA. And they, they need it balanced. Uh, the payload has to be radially symmetric, uh, rotationally symmetrical, otherwise the rocket control system can't function. So you have to put ballast in to deal with the, you've got the camera and all that stuff, and you need to ballast it. And so yes, one of the engineers said, oh, ballast, you say? Well, here's a piece of ballast I made in my garage. <laughs> And so that, that was, I uh, forget, that might have been December 61, um, but that was, uh, Oscar one went up. It was just a beacon, but like, we've been able to in space almost from the beginning. Uh, low power is sort of the inverse of, of DX. It's operating, in some cases, in the milliwatt range, over thousands of kilometers. That's extraordinarily difficult, but it's part of, uh, part of the fun. Uh, moon bounce is precisely what it sounds like. It is absolutely absurd. It's a half a million kilometre, 40,000 kilometre round trip, uh, plus the fact that the moon is not a terribly good reflector, and so the, the losses are astronomical. So this is a very weak signal mode. Um, how do balloons? If you're putting a camera in a balloon and you want to recover it after it bursts, 
uh, you don't want to rely on another network because your, your communication module won't come into range until maybe a second or two before impact. And if it fails to associate with the network and send a, a location packet fast before you hit the ground, then you won't be able to recover it. So there are groups that we use to attach to high to hydrogen balloons, as well as a camera, a very lightweight transmitter with a GPS receiver. And it's just transmitting continuously on an angle frequency where it is, and then giving this gear like this to just track it. So that when you, yeah, you'll lose it at some point on the way down, because it's in free fall, but you can trap that fairly lightly, because you don't need to lose communication at any point from the this descent from the stratosphere to the ground. Uh, meteor scatter is also as nice as it sounds. Uh, as a meteor passes through the ionosphere, it disturbs the layers of ionized gas and so creates a gradient. You can actually use the, tra the activated trail behind it for maybe five or ten seconds to reflect radio signals. Uh, so this crazy is the same thing with the aircraft, not with the trail lines behind the aircraft, but with the aircraft itself. The, at the distances involved, the power levels are below what's relevant for the aircraft. It's not interfering with the aircraft signals. Uh, direction finding and fox hunting is a sort of recreational activity with radio and mountain popping is something I enjoy doing, which involves what it sounds like, hiking gear up to the top of a mountain. Uh, that's useful for range. You've got a really good low, low angle entry to the ionosphere, no clutter, and often on mountain tops, no interference. So your receivers can be very sensitive. Um, what mobile phones don't do, operate when the network isn't there, as at uh, Puerto Rico. Operate where it doesn't exist, particularly desert areas and, and wilderness areas. Um, DIY electronics, if you start playing with the contents of your phone, IMDA might have a problem with that. Um, and high power, again, you can't use a mobile phone at hundreds of watts. Uh, I mentioned um, spheric. Um, this is something where, in a single hop, you can do anything up to about 3,000 kilometers uh, on as little as 100 watts with a 10 meter high sort of aluminum tube. A group of us operating on Ubin last year were talking to stations in Portland, Oregon, literally the other side of the planet. So that's perhaps 10 bounces of, of the ionosphere and the oceans. Uh, but that requires antennas that are you know, 10 meter high antennas are very practical. And so in sort of urban areas, walkie talkies and repeaters on hills or high buildings are more, or masts are more popular. This is the same idea as mobile phones, minus all of the complexity. Um, and of course, yes push that up to the kilometers and you have that. Ideally, you have it at 36,000 kilometers, at which point this happens. Um, that's either, meaning that the rotational period is the same as the time it takes the Earth to do one full rotation. If you use a sun-centric or sun-Earth line centric coordinate system, that's 24 hours. If you use a galaxy-centric coordinate system, that's 23 hours and 36 minutes. The term sidereal day familiar to anyone in this room? No astronomers? Okay. Um, just um, we think in terms of a 24 hour day because our frame of reference moves during the year. As the Earth moves around the Sun, the frame of reference is moving. And so, in fact, it's only uh, if you're looking at a, a star or a constellation rising at 9 pm tonight, tomorrow night it will rise at 8 56 because the the galaxy is moving with us. But yeah, whichever way you measure it, this is only useful if you can afford to get a satellite up to 36,000 kilometers. That's quite costly. Particularly compared to, say, like 500. If you look at all the CubeSat type stuff that people are doing, it tends to be around the 500 kilometer mark. Uh, in which case, your satellite will cross the sky in, in matter of minutes. Whereas this, if, this way, you just sort of bolt an antenna in the middle. Uh, this is, sounds like a great visualization, but the reality is this. It's a hobby. Um, so, no, we get No, it's in box. Okay. Oh, come on. Anyway, so they, to give you a sense of uh, what's going on, this is all of the active or potentially active satellites that I'm aware of that either carry amateur traffic or are beaconing on an amateur frequency. So it's fairly popular, fairly common for a satellite to be periodically transmitting a beacon 
for gestation while alive, increase my family status, my temperature, and my course line. And so this is a real-time visualization of uh, where the left As you can see, there are two or three kind of the same point others rising. That's unusual. Other times you have like an hour between. This is a thing called G-Predict. It takes data gathered by NASA and NORAD uh, to keep track of where satellites are, partly to communicate with them and partly to avoid collisions. Collisions within orbiting devices is extremely energetic and maybe a big problem. But the data is made public, so I'll talk about that. This is, so this tool is used both to work out where they are, but also to control the, uh, the antenna rotator and the radius. So, uh, very briefly, I will not be getting into the uh, differential calculus side. Um, in order to, sh to describe an orbit, you need six parameters. So it's not a, if you, if, firstly, orbit, orbits aren't generally circular, so you need a, an eccentricity parameter to describe the shape of the orbit. Uh, secondly, the axis of the length uh, is not necessarily perpendicular to the to pivot against your reference plane. The, re the reference plane is the, the ecliptic, which is where the, the plane in which the planets orbit the sun, but also the orbit the center of the, the galaxy. They are the same plane. Um, and it's sort of north, if you like, is a uh, star in the Aries constellation. So that sort of gives you the starting point. Um, the, the plane of the orbit is tilted with respect to that. Uh, this is not necessarily perpendicular to this. So you need a parameter called the longitude of the ascending node, the place where it climbs to the plane. You need the argument of the which is a so that way. Uh, the risk is a bit more complicated, but you, you end up needing six parameters to describe an orbit. Um, which I'll skip most of. Uh, I'll point out just to give you a sense of how old this stuff is. Uh, these are the four variants of the model that are used. Um, the, the major rewrite was into 424. Because well, NASA has had to know, right, since the 60s, where their spacecraft are. And so there's, just, there's a continuation. There's never been a break. So the, all the stuff that's around that's in use uses these same models, albeit not actually in Fortran anymore. Uh, if you're really interested, Hundred page report which contains dozens of pages of differential of, of calculus that explains how the thing works. Uh, more practically, you just get a lack of it. Uh, what's intriguing about it is that it's observed by NORAD and published by in cooperation with NASA, but the change thing is going to be to privatize it. But this guy Kelso, who was part of the organization that produced this stuff in the first place, got a license to just uh, publicly distribute it. So despite the fact that there's now this sort of formalism in the way, this is just a guy who's been part of the program for decades and has permission to give it away without sign-up, which we rely on. All the software he was looking at automatically downloads his version of the, of the elements. What are they? Why are they called two-line elements? Um, <coughs> you know what this is? It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so this is an eight-position punch card, and this is one way of Interpreting this is to have a byte this way that represents a character. So if you were to print this, this would, this would occupy one line on an 80 column page. To describe an orbit requires two lines, plus two line elements. Uh, it's very compact. This is for the inner space station. Uh, the breakdown is that the, each of the satellites that's in the database has a number. For ISS, it's 25544. Uh, this is an unclassified uh, element, which probably isn't a big surprise. That's what the U means. Uh, the designator means that the piece of the ISS that's described, which is the, the Zaya module, module, the first module basically, was launched in 1998. It was the 67th launch during that year, and it's the first uh, satellite from that launch. Quite what happens with the newer clusters of satellites that launch, dozens of satellites, like more than 26, I don't know, I've not looked, but that's what the A is basically the the first piece of that launch. Um, the, next, the rest are just the, the parameters that are described. The EPOP and a couple of derivatives, a drag uh, factor to, keep, to deal with atmospheric drag. So I'd like to do gradually, slow down over a period of years. Um, 
and before that like to fire. They had thought about extensibility, even at this point, but there is only format zero. No other format has ever been agreed. So, <laughs> yes, we can describe the next format if it comes to the end, but it never has. Uh, some checksums, nothing else that's horribly exciting, uh, other than they felt the need to describe the number of rotations per day in eight different places, so there's no space before the uh, orbit number. So at the time of this was a year ago, I think, the ISS had performed 56,000 orbits. Again, what happens when it crosses 100,000, I'm not sure, but that's still 20 years away. Um, oh, out of order, okay. So the JavaScript line we're going to use for doing this from our code. So you basically tell it where you are, when it is, and then we'll tell you uh, what's rising over the next hour, which, which satellite's for. I mean, and given a particular satellite, most usefully, what azimuth angle and what zenith angle do you need to point an antenna at it? Uh, the rotor control is simplicity itself. Um, you connect to a port and without one second send a message that is uh, P, meaning position, and as an angle, as an angle, a new line. There's, there's nothing else to it. Uh, it's very stupid. It ignores commands, so you draw off moving. So you've got to wait for it to finish carrying out the previous command, which will take a minute, and then it will ignore anything that's in between. Uh, for a workshop I did in June, I actually produced a simulator. Uh, if you want to play with it, feel free. Uh, this will actually give you an in browser a representation of where the thing is. So you can then sort of talk to it. It's the point was to allow a bunch of workshop participants to build their own controllers with the simulator before we went outside and did it for real. And we did. Two of the, two of the participants were successful in uh, getting this thing to point at real satellites and, and had radios hooked up and this um, So, how to do it? So, you, you can certainly do it freehand. But the problem with that is you having to point the antenna and rotate it and operate the radio and log and maybe look at a tracking application all at the same time, which I found a bit overwhelming. So my initial solution uh, was find a friend. Uh, that's over at the computing building here. Um, my subsequent solution, however, oops, hello. Ah, uh, okay, was to build the, uh, the tracker because it could then sort of take well, off my hands completely the following of a satellite across the sky. Uh, one of the problems, or the additional problems, is that camera satellites are cheap. In general, they do not have good attitude control or indeed any attitude control. So there's a little bumbling at random through space. And so the antenna's orientation with respect to you changes the whole time. And so, okay, how do you fix that problem? The solution to that problem, or well, one solution, is to use is start with the antennas. So this is not a small configuration. I've managed with the boom behind. Uh, usually it's two antennas with a boom in between. And the corresponding uh, sections of the antenna are at right angles. So the key is they're at the same front to back distance. And then between them, in the cable harness that connects to the radio, you place a quarter wave length of coax. And what that does is transforms two linear antennas, so at right angles, into a circular. And the reason that, that is useful is that it map yeah. here. <laughs> the QFA does the same. Someone asked about the quadrophilias. It's they're doing the same thing. Um, but it means that other than in the dead spot, when the antenna element, when the satellite's position is such that it's pointing an antenna element at you, so off the ends of a, a quarter wave or a yagi, there's a null. There's no, there's no meaningful emission of energy in this direction. It's, it's emitted in this direction. So if a satellite has tumbled to a point where it's antenna is pointing straight down or straight at you, then you're stuck in a null and there's nothing you can do about it. But in every other orientation, the two antennas at right angles plus the, the timing harness means that it will maintain a fairly uniform uh, sensitivity. You lose 3 dB or 50% of your energy for doing so, so there's a, there's a price, but you gain consistency. You just, at whatever in, at orientation the satellite is in, communication can occur so long as it isn't in the null. Um, right, building the thing, you can have a look at it if you like, but it's fairly straightforward. These are basically robotics parts that I bought from a US supplier. Sadly, all US measures. Uh, but yeah, two motors. Uh, one to do the, the azimuth, the compass direction, and one to do the, the elevation. And so uh, these are simple DC motors with reduction gears. 
this is a potential link. And so the, the plastic gears aren't load bearing, they just uh, gear the potential on it, and that, then there's a head, head reconverter on the controller that works out which way the thing is pointing. So this is a sort of cheap, straightforward way of working out which way your stuff is pointing. Were I to build another one, I'd use a rotary encoder. This design was produced by somebody else, I liked it, but I'll just build it. But there's, a, there's some problems with this. Uh, it doesn't deal with end conditions very well. You've got a, you're a bit limited. If you haven't aligned it correctly, as I have, uh, what I think zero degrees is, is, is about 15 degrees off perpendicular to any of the, the sides. And that means a lot of irritating fiddling to get it to zero. So there's, there's, I mean, it does the job, but it's fiddly. Um, right, the cable harness. So there's a couple of things going on here. These, the two end cables, are the same length. Their lengths don't matter. The only important fact is that they are the same length as each other. One goes to each antenna in a, in a right angle pair. The bit in the middle is a quarter wavelength at the frequency that's relevant. So for the shorter elements, which are on the amateur 70 centimeter band, about 430 megahertz, uh, this is 17 centimeters long, a bit less, I think. Uh, for the longer ones, it's about 50 centimeters long. There's two different harnesses. That provides the quarter wave offset that then turns the two uh, linear antennas into a combined circle antenna. But there's another problem. The antennas have a 50 ohm characteristic impedance. Uh, electrical guys, do you know what characteristic impedance means? Give me some nods, okay. For everybody else, I'm not today. Um, but you connect two 50 ohm antennas in parallel and you've got 25 ohm load. Well, now you have a problem because you feed that into a 50 ohm radio and you are reflecting a large fraction of the power, I think it's three quarters of the power being reflected. So that causes losses. And it'll affect back and forth, but a lot of it will end up heating up the coax. Not purely, but enough that you're losing signal in both directions. You're becoming less sensitive on the receive side and you're turning a lot of your transmit power into nothing more than hitting the, the wires. So what you need is a way to transform 25 ohms from the antenna pair to 50 ohms for the radio. So the next quarter wave trick is that a quarter wave coax will transform almost any impedance to almost any impedance. This is voodoo. I accept that it is true. I've looked at the maths. I don't understand it. <laughs> but it works. It works reliably. It's used for all kinds of things by analysts and been for decades. So what you need is a quarter wave coax whose impedance is the square root of the product of the two impedances you're trying to match. So if you're trying to match 50 to 25, what you need is 37 and a half ohm coax. That's all very well and good, except that you can't buy 37 and a half ohm coax. But you can buy 75 ohm coax. So if you've got two bits of quarter wave 75 ohm coax in parallel, you have a quarter wave of 37 and a half ohm coax. So what you're seeing is the quarter wave section in the middle to the phasing, and then a pair of quarter wave sections of slightly thicker coax. 75 to 50 to match the impedance between the parallel antennas and the radio. And so that's for the 70 centimeter, and then the same setup with longer pieces for 2 meter. Uh, this is yet another problem. Uh, the, this setup, because of the potentiometer, is only capable of a 360 degree azimuth, which sounds fine, except that you're not trying to point it just one direction. If you have 360 degrees of azimuth at 90 of elevation, you can point in any direction. But you want to follow a satellite across the sky. And you need to provide fairly uniform motion. And so the idea here is that the, the blue line is the satellite's track, and the red line is the point where the tracker lost contact with the could no longer keep up. And it follows for a while, and then when it reaches its end stop, it has to then turn around. And that might take two minutes. And so by the time it reconnects, you've lost a, a chunk of your transit. So the solution to this problem is to know before the pass whether it crosses north or crosses south and turn the thing around. And there's actually a switch on the, the controller that says, perform, if, if you've flipped it around so that zero is south, you flip the switch and the, the firmware knows to subtract 180 from all the angles. So that it's awkward, but it's solvable. Uh, there are some others. There's something resembling gimbal lock. 
Um, it's not quite the same, but it's a similar problem. For a very high pass, or for a low pass, things are easy. The, the azimuth is progressing uniformly, and the, the zenith goes sort of gently up and gently down. For a very high pass, you get into a situation where the azimuth is that way, and then quite suddenly, it needs to be over there. And so you get up to 90 degrees, and then suddenly the, the zenith stops changing, because now it's going to spend two minutes turning, or a minute and a half turning 100 degrees, and then descend. Don't have a good solution. Passes high enough for it to be a problem are rare. And in practice, because the beam width for the antenna is something like 45, 60 degrees, it's, a, it's reasonably forgiving. If I was feeling virtuous, I would do the work to, to convert an overhead pass into a pass that was 10 degrees off. And then it would mean the azimuth was moved early enough to prevent the problem. But, oh, and no feedback. This is a problem with the design. I didn't design the board. Uh, the serial, it's just an RS-232 serial port, but it only has received data and ground. It has no transmit data. It has no, even though the controller knows where the motors are, there is physically no path to tell the, the host computer that's controlling it uh, where you are. So there's no way to work out what's happening where you're going. You've got to, make, you've got to decide up front what you're going to do and just tell it. Again, workable, just irritating. Um, right, we haven't yet run out of problems. Uh, the next is Doppler. So an ambulance goes past, or an uncommon bicycle with a boombox, the pitch changes. It's Doppler shift. The satellites move fast enough that Doppler shift materially affects the radio frequency, at least on UHF. On VHF, the difference is small enough that the radio will just cope. Uh, an FM receiver uses a phase lock loop, and it will just it'll cope. But at VHF, at 430 megahertz the change is large enough that the receiver will just give up. So you've actually got to adjust the receive frequency during the, the pass. The duplicate program that I showed you earlier is capable of doing that. It knows how to talk to a range of radios and will send commands and to two radios at once if you want. One for transmit and one to receive. That's just one of the list of things you've got to deal with. Uh, the next is heading transmitter. You're only using the satellite in the first place because you can't hear the other guy directly. So now you have a problem, you're both talking to a, a satellite at the same time with the same input frequency. And there's no time domain multiplexing with a, like a Wi-Fi type controller, it's just two human beings with transmit buttons. So what you actually do or expect to do is, is operate two radios at the same time. That your receiver is running while you're transmitting. So you get to hear what the satellite hears. And if, you, if you happen to conflict with the other guy, you'll hear that. Rather than just normally use a walkie-talkie. When, you, when you're talking, you can't hear what's going on. Um, so, full duplex is the ideal approach, but very few commercial bell radios do it. So, in practice, you just use two radios. I mean, you, you can do this if you can find the radio, but I simply couldn't find one that IMD was aware of, and consequently, I just gave up. Fine, I'll just use two cheap radios. Um, that introduces a feedback risk that the receiver will hear the transmitter, and so the solution to that problem is to use two different bands so that you get good separation between the transmitter and the receiver, and that's the reason for the antenna having two completely different sets of elements. Look, they're on different bands and they're at right angles, so that you can be pushing five watts into either VHF or UHF, and the receiver on the other one will not be swapped. Five watts is a lot of power, and, and you, you, there's millimeters between the driven elements, or centimeters, and yet with the elements at right angle and with the frequency separated by about 3 to 1, that's enough for receivers to, to continue to function. And so that trade-off gets designed into the satellites themselves. It's quite common to have the VHF UHF split specifically to solve this problem, to allow full duplex operation. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that went too far or too deep. At this point, I think I'll stop and uh, invite questions. How much of this makes sense? Questions, comments? Why do you choose the length of the rods and the angular and the distances between the rods? Uh, that's a very well studied problem. Um, the short answer is I bought those as is from a company who uses those are in fact arrow shafts. The aluminum shafts are made for arrows. It's, it's arrow antenna. So they just take things that for that purpose and, and sell them as I mean they cut them and add screws into them, but sell them as antennas. Uh, but the design of it is fairly well understood problem and there are 
sort of papers and calculators around to make those decisions. If you want to sit down and study how it works, do so. The physics is reasonably simple because this, it's a very simple system. Uh, but in general, you just take a calculator and punch in. I want this frequency, this many elements, at least this much gain. What do I need? You can. Uh, so the someone asked about the use of quadrophilia uh, antennas. Uh, so a fairly common option is to use the QFHs, which is a it's, it's four helixes. Um, the big benefit is you don't have to. It's got a very broad pattern, but it tends to exclude the ground and overhead, which is good because you minimize sensitivity to local interference, but not perfectly. It's got some holes of sensitivity. But the really great strength of it is you don't have to point it. You just stick it up and it works. That suffers from uh, a lack of sensitivity, uh, inefficient use of transmitter power, because you're spreading it everywhere rather than focusing it, which means you need more power. And I'm like, oh, right, so portable gear in Singapore, you can't use more than five watts of transmitter power. A little bit of room to double the effective power by having three on the huggy, but that's it. And so a QFH, you, but you use a QFH for a, a base station type setup anyway. And that point, okay, you're wasting some power using 25 watts instead of five, it's fine. The problem with that remains the overhead passes. The, the QFH has a sort of nice pancake uh, pattern, but it has a null overhead, so high passes you blind. So, you know, there's, there's trade-offs. And as I said, part of, you know, the awesome uh, part of it is just like the fun of playing with electronics and mechanical systems and making stuff work. It's, so there's a little bit overkill for what I'm doing. Others? Stunned silence over here. No? Just kind of mentioned that the arrangement of the uh, Yagi Uda make it somehow similarly polarized. Yes. Why is there still a loss in between? That's what happens. When you convert from negative circular, you are basically giving up. Yes, I want to understand the loss if you are using uh, a linearly polarized antenna to receive RCP signals, but if effectively the antenna is circularly polarized, then there shouldn't be a loss that you receive. Uh, for example, well, you've just made exactly the point. It's effective loss. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's really two linear antennas. Okay. So, for there to be no loss, um, what you would need is. Is it two sine waves? I don't think what it is. But I think it's a pair. If you add a pair of sine waves that are out of sync. No, I can't. I, no, I can't read it. Sorry. Uh, but the point is, when you. you if that's. Uh, theta and that's gain. Sorry, my writing's horrible. If, that, but if, that, if that's the angle between the um, this is simple. If I know how to explain it, what it ends up occurring is when you add the two curves together, you you have a you have a problem. That's not. If you have a real, if you have an actual helix, uh -huh. then it does what you expect. When you have a pair of linear polarized antennas, you, it's not. Wait, wait, <laughs> when they combine it to a single coaxial cable, okay. Uh, right, yes. But, but that, it's not so much that, it's the, what's happening up front. That you are remaining, you are in reality more sensitive uh, in some directions and less sensitive than others. And maybe there's a better way to, to say it. If you're adding these two together, you're not getting this. Oh. What you're getting is... Sorry. Uh, all the other way around. So it's, so it's, it's not uniformly sensitive, and that translates into an average of a 3 degree loss. Okay. So, you know, but the, it doesn't matter. Like if you've got a radio that has a, like a, it's sensitive at minus 100 dB. Even walkie-talkies are sensitive at minus 80. Um, the loss of 3 dB is nearly on there. 
and it's common. You lose more in the reflection in the, in the cable harness. So, but yeah, if you uh, the other is to make a helical antenna. The difficult the problem with doing that is that you're locked into one interpretation of the other, and there are in fact some satellites that have helical antennas. So that for those in those cases, you're better off with a, a linear antenna. If you've got this set up for right hand, and the station you're talking to has a satellite you're talking to has a left handed antenna, then of course you've got you're down like something like 30 dB. But you, then you start to have a problem. And so that's why uh, there are actually two, the two two pieces are helpful because they can jump from one to the other. And in fact, with the, I've got a preamp, I didn't show it, but a, a, a preamp for use on the receive side that actually has two inputs in a relay. And so you can, in fact, immediately, for those satellites which do, in fact, have circular antennas, you can switch uh, live without having to go out and sort of re cable the antenna. But that's, yeah, if you look at uh, ground stations that use helical antennas, they have two one clockwise and one end clockwise. So you, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Right? <laughs> but they solve the 3D problem. Because they, they really are. Well, they, with respect to particular, when, you, when they're talking to a linear antenna, of course, they're 3D down. So there's, but, but again, it's not a lot. It's not, it's not something worth optimizing for. There's, there's so many other losses involved. The difference between the path loss for a satellite near the horizon and for a satellite in the head is, is something like 20 dB. So you pull 15, maybe. So yeah, you're like, okay, we're down 3 dB, which means the first 5 degrees of the first. 10 degrees maybe of the, uh, of the pass, we, we, we're below the most threshold. Okay. Not a disaster. Thank you. No one else? This was either crystal clear and everyone understood everything, or completely incomprehensible. <laughs> one more naive question. Sure. Question. If we can receive signals easily with a program system, can we also then Yes, the thing. And the, so it works exactly the same way. And the, so the, the thinking behind the two radios that one is receiving and one is transmitting. And that's the point of the two bands that your transmitters your transmitter and receiver on different bands. Some satellites have VHF up and UHF down, some have UHF up and VHF down. Some have low UHF up and high UHF or S band down. But it's very common to have this split specifically so you can do that. But you, it's not. Uh, in some places, no one would be too fussed about it. In this country, strictly speaking, uh, you shouldn't be operating a receiver without a license anyway. Uh, but if you've got, if you're licensed for receiving, then you, you're perfectly free to transmit uh, as long as you're operating under the usual and the rules. Are we able to make sense of the data we receive? So a lot of this is uh, voice. Of the 20 odd that I had on my map, there a good eight have working. Voice transponders, really voice repeaters, they're just FM. And so the, the interaction is nothing more complicated than a pair of walkie talkies plugged into the, the cable harnesses. Uh, but a good number of them have uh, digital. A fair number use Morse code for their beaconing. <laughs> in fact, when I did the workshop for JSConf in June, where I was, had developers driving, uh, they had not heard Morse code before. And when they, when they acquired, either the antenna was sort of pointing the right place, as as F twenty nine, whatever. Suddenly, you know, I recognise that I'm pointing my way because I can hear. I didn't have the Doppler correction uh, under machine control, so I was doing it by hand. And that's, of course, I knew what I was listening for, so I just kept that audible. But participants had never ever heard Morse code. It was some sort of funky breakbeat. Well, yeah, sort of. Uh, but yes, a fair number use uh, digital modes called AX twenty five. So an amateur version of X25, which made all sense in the 90s, perhaps in the makes today. It's a narrowband digital mode that will work in uh, 15 kilohertz wide or 12 kilohertz wide FM channels. Because again, cheap walkie-talkies will do, or cheap radios will do that. Um, the software for doing it is built into several versions of Linux. Uh, there are Windows applications that will do it. And there's a bunch of stuff built on top of that. So things like Winlink Radio, um, this is more HF than VHF and UHF, but there's, there's a bunch of digital modes that are used for email. Sort of SNS with complicated gear, but a very long range. Oh, well, yes, this is a bunch of digital modes that amateurs use, and they're mostly they're well documented.
So, sure. Okay. Oh. I'll wrap at this point.